All right. Good evening, folks. Uh, today we'll be talking about Hadoop on top of OpenStack. So before we get into the topic, uh, let's, let me just give you a quick snapshot of who's Hortonworks. So Hortonworks uh, is the provider of the 100%, the only 100% open source Apache Hadoop enterprise ready distribution. We are a spin off from Yahoo. We employ the original architects, developers, and operators of Hadoop within our company. We work with the ecosystem to forward all the different projects involved with uh, Apache Hadoop. We distribute the only 100% open source platform, and then we work with the enterprises and support that platform. So let's get down to the topic. The question is, why run Hadoop on OpenStack? So if you look in the IT world today, uh, big data Hadoop and OpenStack are pretty much like the two big celebrities. So the most logical thing is, hey, let's, let, let's get them married, right? But we don't want this thing to be like a regular celebrity marriage. We want it to last. And for that, we need to figure out what are, what are the fundamentals? You know, does it really make sense? And we'll spend a couple minutes on that, uh, starting with the question, why, you know, what, is, what does OpenStack really bring to the table for Hadoop? So the way we see it is OpenStack alleviates a lot of the operational issues with Apache Hadoop. In the typical enterprise, if you look at the little elephant in the middle there, when, 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 they, when they embark on the Hadoop journey, they see like different groups within the enterprise wanting to run their own Hadoop clusters. You've got finance, marketing, compliance, and all of these guys have different requirements in terms of data privacy, capacity, et cetera. On top of that, there's different data sources. So you've got mobile data, you've got web data. And not only that, there's different use cases that, that need to be supported. There's bad, there's interactive. So what, is, what we see happening is enterprises end up having to spin up multiple versions of the Hadoop cluster. And if that's not enough, as they go around in their journey of supporting Hadoop, they see that uh, to support their production deployments, they got to do QA, they got to do performance testing, and all of this need, means different versions of the cluster running. Having to do this on top, of physical, on top of a physical environment is extremely cost prohibitive and takes time, right? So OpenStack really helps solve these problems for Hadoop. And the next question is, uh, what does Hadoop provide to OpenStack? The way we see it is it is three real important things. First is it's a low risk application within the enterprise. Uh, as these guys are embarking on their Hadoop journey, Hadoop itself doesn't have any legacy within the, within the IT world, right? There's no legacy processes. People don't understand Hadoop very well. So it sounds like a perfect POC application to, to, to kick the tires on OpenStack. The second aspect is Hadoop provides the horizontal scale. For a typical cloud application, we don't, we don't, you know, it's expected that the application itself provides the linear scalability and does not rely on the infrastructure. And that's what Hadoop brings to the table for OpenStack. And third part is, as we discussed, it gives you the shared platform. So all in all, it provides a great greenfield use case for OpenStack. So with that, uh, you know, it makes sense to integrate Hadoop and OpenStack, and Hortonworks announces its support to Project Savannah, which was proposed by Mirantis some time back, to facilitate the integration between Apache Hadoop and OpenStack. Now, just like any, any successful wedding, you know, there's got to be certain ground rules that you sign up for. And the way we see uh, uh, Savannah working with this integration is that it will provide the glue layer between Hadoop and OpenStack. So Hadoop doesn't need to know about the internals of OpenStack and vice versa. Savannah will track the Hadoop clusters, do the mapping between the tenants and, and, and the clusters themselves provide an API for Apache Ambari to, do, to, to manage the Hadoop clusters. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel on the OpenStack side. So to summarize some of the key benefits, right? The first thing is uh, self-provisioned Hadoop. Uh, so operators don't need to be the bottlenecks every time a cluster provisioning request comes in. The user can self-provision the cl cluster as they see fit. The second is uh, reducing the errors in the provisioning process itself. So Hadoop is, is not a simple system to, to get up and run, right? Uh, it has a lot of moving parts. To, if we package this uh, behind a well-structured template-based provisioning process, it really sort of takes away uh, all the different areas where there could be operator error in, in running a cluster. The second part is Elastic Hadoop. So you can create a pool of resources on top of your physical environment and scale, and scale up and scale down the cluster as needed. And this can be incredibly helpful as we see enterprises do different levels of performance testing on Hadoop, or even for their production Hadoop clusters as their capacity, uh, capacity requirements go up and down based upon the workload. 
The second is uh, cluster timeshare. So we see a lot of customers saying that, hey, we got our OpenStack deployment running, but it doesn't do a whole lot at night. Can we run some Hadoop bad jobs during nighttime? So with this, with this integration, they will be able to do that. So share time between different tenants and different workloads based upon factors like time of the day. And the last one is multi-tenancy. So as, as I said, uh, enterprises have to support different, different use cases, data patterns, and uh, uh, operational and groups within the enterprise. Uh, they have different, different SLA requirements on top of Hadoop. So you know, there is batch workloads, there is interactive workloads. These workloads need different levels of resource assignment. So by running that cluster on top, of, uh, on top of OpenStack, you can control the resource assignment at a VM level and support different SLA requirements. And the second aspect is uh, maintenance, which is often ignored by vendors, but it, it's incredibly important for the operators who run these clusters. You know, as, as, they, as they see uh, Hadoop expanding within the enterprise, there will be different versions of Hadoop clusters for the different internal groups that they have to support. How do they take care of upgrading these clusters? How do they take care of running different versions of Hadoop across the same set of physical infrastructure? So all these problems are solved by this integration. So next, I will walk, walk through some of the features along each of these buckets in some more detail. So the first is self-provisioning. And uh, there's two options here. One is template-based provisioning, and second is job flow-based provisioning. So on the template-based provisioning, in the most simple, simplest terms, so what the aim is to capture the entire requirements of the Hadoop cluster in form of a uniform template. So typically, an enterprise goes through a process of tweaking and tuning the cluster, and then they're they are happy with it. And next time, they just want to cookie cut back. right? So you can capture all those, all those requirements in the form of a template and provide a single, single click, simple provisioning experience to your users. But there will be people who would want to sort of get more control over this template provisioning process. And for that, we, we would provide a second level of uh, template that is a little bit more granular, and they'll be node-based. And the information you capture in that can be resource-based, uh, resource so you can have a template based on the size of the node, or it can be function-based. So different, there are different uh, nodes with different functions within a Hadoop cluster. So you can have a template for name node, region server, data node, as you see fit. Users can modify those templates and then provision clusters based on the modified versions of those templates or save those templates. And in the second phase, we, uh, we look to provide a more of an Amazon EMR type experience where customers can come in and upload the data either on a Swift object store or, an, or, or to HDFS. Then pick the type of job they want to run, uh, big, hive, or the other job types, and get the results again either on Swift or HDFS. So two basic options split into different phases. Uh, let's get into a little bit detail about how this provisioning process will work. And this, the case I'm covering here is assuming that there's a simple uh, uh, VM image that just has the OS, nothing else in it, right? So the user goes, goes to Horizon and specifies the cluster requirements, all the details about nodes, services, how many resources it needs. It will go to the Savannah controller, which will in turn go to Nova, fetch the right images from Glance, and fire up those, fire up those virtual machines. At this point, there is just virtual machines. There's no Hadoop cluster yet. And that's where Savannah delegates the responsibility to the uh, Hadoop management platform called Apache Ambari. It will start the Apache Ambari management server and pass it the cluster blueprint and let Ambari figure out all the service configuration and setting up the Hadoop cluster itself. So this, this sort of key puts a clean delineation between OpenStack and Hadoop, so both of them can take care of their own set of responsibilities. So uh, once the cluster is provisioned, the next step is uh, how do I actually manage and monitor this cluster? So the way we uh, envision this to happen is uh, there will be a single sign-on between the OpenStack Horizon dashboard and the Apache Ambari management server. So based upon the VMs a tenant has access to, when they log in, they will see uh, the Hadoop clusters running across those VMs. They can click on Manage link for those clusters, and you'll be single signed-on into the Apache manage management uh, UI console. Uh, there's one option of loading the management, uh, the Apache Ambari UI within the Horizon cluster itself, or it could be a separate window. All right, moving on to elasticity. So the way I've broken down elasticity here is two dimensions. There, on the x-axis, there is the cluster life, and on the y-axis, there is the node elasticity. So for phase one, we will be supporting upon, on, uh, focusing on manual node elasticity. What I mean by manual is there will be an API on top of the Savannah controller and a UI plugin for Horizon where the users can sort of uh, 
add and remove nodes to their clusters, and VM provisioning will be completely transparent to that process. But it will be supported for long-lived as well as short-lived clusters. The short-lived use case is uh, very, very relevant for dev and QA type, type workloads, where someone just needs to run some script, uh, some pig script or a MapReduce job, and see if you know, it's, it's, it's giving out the right results before they sort of migrate that thing to production. And the long-lived uh, uh, cluster is more suitable for, some, for folks who are actually running production clusters or even like staging environments on top of OpenStack. For phase two, uh, we will focus uh, more on rule-based node elasticity. Uh, when I say rule-based, the, rule uh, the rule could be defined on multiple different factors. One of them could be the state, uh, the, the state of the job flow itself. So you could for, uh, foresee a scenario where a certain step of the job flow needs a lot of compute power. And there needs to be a way for the user to specify that rule and automatically provision the additional VM images that provide that, uh, that, those, that additional compute power. And this could be uh, useful for uh, job flow based clusters where the provisioning is based on job flow itself and the cluster goes away after the, after the job flow completes. So some detail on uh, our, the Swift object store integration. So when I, when I spoke about elasticity, uh, elasticity, I mentioned that there is an option to upload the data on Swift or on HDFS. Now when the data resides on Swift, there needs to be a way for a MapReduce job to consume that data and process that data. So that will be enabled by this HDFS Swift Connect uh, bridge. So what this bridge does is for, for a typical MapReduce job or a pig or a high script, nothing changes. For that, for, for that particular script or a job. It still functions as if it is working with HDFS. So it deals with, or deals with the directory and file system hierarchy. But all that happens is that the bridge transparently uh, converts all the commands uh, into a way that uh, the Swift object store understands. And it does that by, through a single, uh, single sign-on through Keystone. The reason that this is possible is the Swift file naming convention supports forward slashes. So if you look in this picture, all that is happening is that that directory structure is being collapsed into a file, into a file structure. So we have dir slash file one that provides that uh, simulation of actually being a hierarchical directory structure. The other point here is uh, I want to mention here is you can we support multiple different Swift stores, not just one. And you can uh, you support multiple different containers across these different Swift stores. The, two, the way to set up this integration is uh, there, there will be a single uh, a shim that you have to install on the Hadoop cluster node through which you expect to access the Swift object store and do the configuration uh, provided the keystone login information and you're, you'll, you'll be up and running. For the phase two of this integration effort, we will be focusing primarily on bug fixes and optimizations. All right, the last part is multi-tenancy. So for phase one, you know, I've, I've split it in three dimensions. There is access, resource, and version isolation. Now resource and version isolation uh, is sort of free to some extent by function of running inside virtual machines. There is one aspect for, of resource isolation though that is important here, is, and that is the ability to pin a Hadoop node to a, for a certain physical host. And the reason why that is important is as, as, as we see enterprises supporting different internal customers, they might have to provide a certain set of SLAs to, uh, for, to these different internal customers. And for that, to avoid the typical noisy neighbor problem in, in a cloud environment, there, might, there, is, there needs to be a way to say that for a given tenant, these are the different hosts that the tenant will get, and this, these are the different hosts on top of which the Hadoop cluster should run, and nobody else should interfere on those hosts, right? So the ability to pin the Hadoop node VM to a certain set of physical hosts will provide that functionality. For the phase two of this effort, uh, we will focus on providing a single Ambari management server per tenant. So in phase one, uh, as you provision more Hadoop clusters, there will be a different instance of the Ambari management server spun up for each instance of the cluster. But for phase two, we will collapse that down to a per tenant basis. basis there'll be only one single Ambari management server. So you don't have to deal with the overhead of managing multiple management servers. And then there, and there is, of course, the enhancement needed to Keystone uh, to integrate with Keystone, so you can uh, do uh, authentication and authorization at the job flow level. So that's all. Uh, that brings me to the end of this talk. Uh, to get more information, uh, we provide a Hortonworks sandbox, which is a pre-built environment with test data. Uh, follow us on Twitter or email me. My email address is right there. Thank you very much. <laughs>